Huh? Oh, ready to go? Say when. Four seconds ago. Okay, hello. This is Free Thought Forum. It's a program by two groups, the Rationalists of East Tennessee and the Atheist Society of Knoxville. I'm Joe Barnhart, and we're going to have a guest speaker today. Uh, if you do believe in God or you don't, you shouldn't be alone. And uh, so the Rationalists of East Tennessee are, uh, have provided an open forum, as, have, as has the group called Ask, and we'll talk about that later. It's a call-in show. And so uh, if you have some thoughts to share with us, do that. And we'll give you some numbers at, at tweet com uh, comments and at FFTV Knox. And uh, the Society that of uh, Atheists of Knoxville and the rest of East Tennessee, our speaker is going to be a, a guest speaker uh, that we got from a university campus here in town, the, the University of Tennessee, and we'll get into this later on. And, uh, but that's a, a thing separate from what I want to do right now. Um, got to talk about our sponsors and things of that sort, and then get to our, our program. Uh, the Atheist Society of Knoxville will meet in uh, a restaurant for food and conversation, and they are having on the desk there a book called The God Delusion. And the Rationalists of East Tennessee have monthly activities on the first and third Sunday mornings. They're usually lectures and, and then vivid discussions and lively discussions. And the second Sunday of the month in the afternoon is a book club. And uh, you don't have to read the book to get into the discussion, <laughs> but it would help sometimes. And then uh, there's a reason rally that some went to in South Carolina, which said, and, and I think there ought to be a special program on that, a lot of thoughtful people went down there. Okay, let's get to our guest today, is Dr. Irvin Darwin, and she's going to talk on the <laughs> origin of the Hebrew Bible and early Judaism, and I want to say she is uh, on the faculty at the University of Tennessee, and we had to make clear and I want to make clear, her guest appearance here is not to promote anything except the search for truth. <laughs> and she's, a, she's an academician. And uh, so I'm, we're trying to pick her brain to find out what the scholars are talking about in this world of, of uh, the development of the Hebrew Bible. So welcome to this thing, a Thanks, very, Jeff. very difficult topic. <laughs> <laughs> difficult. We'll do the best we can. Okay. Well, tell me what you found to be in the, I mean, usually in the study of any field, you, you are surprised. Of course. And uh, what, what are some of the surprises as you move into your study that uh, were, were the most interesting to you and uh, get, get to you? All right, well, the answer to that would change depending on if I was answering as a graduate student or if I'm answering as an assistant uh, professor or, yeah, I suspect it would change next year. Um, yeah. Or even as a young student, right, first starting out oh, as yeah, an undergrad yeah, and yeah. becoming interested in religious studies. There were all sorts of surprises then. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can remember my first uh, study in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, first, we had to learn some Hebrew. Of course, you, you're, that's your field. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and, uh, but I remember uh, how difficult it was for me to realize it took years and, and decades and maybe centuries to, to form, to form what right. we call one book. It's not uh, uh, what surprised it's me. It's not one book. That's it's right. A, it's a whole library. And even using the word book uh -huh. is a much later reading, right? I mean, initially, uh -huh. the thing that we call the Hebrew Bible, or if you're a Christian, you call the Old Testament, wasn't in a combined volume at all. It was a series of scrolls that were uh -huh. passed down separately and copied separately and wasn't collected into something that was a bound volume for quite some time. So even the way the Bible looks when you buy it in a bookstore is a little uh -huh. bit misleading. And they didn't have a concordance. They, they, they certainly didn't. <laughs> didn't have a Young's, a Strong's, or any other kind of concordance at their disposal. So Although the rabbis yeah. were incredibly astute. Uh -huh. And so probably any kind of modern concordance 
even any kind of modern commentary that's noticed difficulties in the text, a rabbi at some point would, would, has already commented yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah. that's it. So we'll give credit where credit's due there. Okay, now, uh, I don't know about you, but I remember uh, reading the Bible mm -hmm. in, in my youth and then reading it later. Right. And, it, and then it seemed like a different book. How, does that happen in college when you have Oh, students? sure, sure. Yeah. Um, one of the common, one of the common things I see in my students uh -huh. is a sense of familiarity about the Hebrew Bible. Uh -huh. Because let's be honest, even certain phrases in English are in oh, English yeah. because of the King James translation of the Hebrew Bible. So there's a reason that we feel familiar about it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But that familiarity is misleading. Right? Uh -huh. The further you move into the text and uh -huh. into the historical scenario and into the ancient Near Eastern um, setting in which this text was created, uh -huh. the more you realize it's not so familiar uh -huh. as you once thought. That's a whole another world, set of worlds. It absolutely is. It's, a, it's uh -huh. removed from us in every way, time, space, geography, class, race, ethnicity, I mean, you name it. We are in a very different space yeah. now than we are then. So people tend to erase how much their own worldview affects their reading yeah, of this book. And yeah. I think the more you read it, and the more you read it, I don't mean critically in the sense of negatively, I mean critically in the sense of really yeah, like reading a, it carefully, yeah, right? Like a music critic, yeah. Right, then the more you realize this book is much more than you thought it was. Uh -huh. And perhaps you have influenced your own reading of yeah. it much more than you thought you had. So, uh, uh, what, do, what do you think? It, it, it is incredibly human. The, the, the Hebrew Bible, the incredibly, I mean, it, it has all the nicks and tapes. It does, it does. I mean, things I would have edited out had uh, I been one of the biblical well, authors. They're in there, you know? told the truth about Moses and a lot of people that... <laughs> David, for example, uh, right? I mean, David is this hero of ancient Israel and then, of course, into Judaism. But, you know, the Bible didn't scrimp about details concerning David's home life or the way his family turned out or uh, even moments where people seem to disagree with David having become the king at all. There, it's in there. Yeah. Ecclesiastes. And how he, and how he became a king. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. The rise to the throne or... Um, Could you write? Say you were a novelist and uh, had time. Right. Uh, say three or four years to <laughs> call the Hebrew uh, godfather. <laughs> <laughs> David. Poor David. David. <laughs> I mean, it is... They're incredibly rich characters. Yeah. Right? They didn't. Jacob is another one, right? Oh, yeah. Jacob is a complicated character. It's not yeah. all good. There's some tricksies in there, right? Where Jacob is definitely doing things he's not really supposed to be doing. Yeah, well, yeah. He and his mother get some a off few with comeuppances a along the way. I mean, the characters have arc. They go from uh -huh. a place, they learn things, they fail. You know, uh, I yeah. think that's an incredible. Um, so you have a lot of moral failure in the. Also, also yeah. Samson. Samson's an incredibly interesting and problematic character in yeah. the Book of Judges, right? I mean, is he good? Is he bad? He succeeds yeah. in his role as a judge, but only as he dies, right? I mean, uh -huh, uh -huh, yeah. It, it's not monolithic. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Well, that may be why it's lasted so much. Not because everything in it is true. Yeah. Uh, it's in, the, in true in the sense that a story can be true even though the characters are fictional. You can still have, I remember a scientist, I can't remember who it was, said he, it took him a long time to realize that in s some types of truths can't be communicated as well except in fiction. <laughs> and and that, I've thought about that for a long time. Well, I mean, did George Washington have to actually chop down a cherry tree uh -huh. for that American parable to be meaningful, right? I mean, there's a question there about truth with a capital T. Does it have to be a big meta-narrative truth, or can we be happy with truth with a lowercase t, no, it's, right? It's truths, it, local truths. Yeah, so a fiction can be truthful, but still not be historically Well, so that's, factual. I mean, what I deal with my students a topic that comes up quite frequently is that when we approach a text assuming it to be historically accurate, uh -huh. there's a, a great deal of modern baggage uh -huh. that comes along with that way of approaching a text. Right? Uh -huh. We expect there to be CNN cameras uh -huh. <laughs> at uh -huh. the creation of the world and that somehow anything written is going to be exactly the way it happened. And I'm not certain that an, a reader 
uh -huh. 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, uh, would have thought about things the same way. I mean, we have to good, be clear uh, about our modern so sort of so obsession with reality TV, for example, which we all know isn't really real. Uh, I got you. But yet, somehow, a movie is more persuasive to us if it says based on a true story. Oh, yeah. Right? In fact, I, mean, I, I remember, uh, I know a man in, ten, in, in Chattanooga once said, uh, saw a person on TV, a character. Mm -hmm. He said, I thought he died last month. <laughs> well, he did die on the program. <laughs> oh, right. Right, right, <laughs> see, right. But right. I, I see what you mean sometimes. You, you get caught up in stories and you take them to be historical reality, <laughs> where the story may not be about that at all. <laughs> Absolutely. And isn't it interesting that it takes only one line? So, for example, if you're reading a text and you read the line, and this happened in a long time ago in a land far, far away. Uh -huh. That's all you need to know that what comes next isn't meant to be a historically accurate narrative. Yeah. One line is enough to cue you in for the genre. Well, how are we supposed to catch those one lines in ancient literature? Uh, I mean, what if you didn't know it happened a long time ago in a land far, far away was the cue that this was a fairy tale? Uh, Would you then read, you know, Sleeping Beauty as if it were historical reality? Uh-huh. Yeah, most kids today, Maybe. <laughs> after yeah. a certain age, would say, no, not, no, not right. historical. but Because we're socialized to get the genre yeah, cues. Uh -huh. But the fact is that the Hebrew Bible is not only a complex document, it's an ancient document. And there's just many ways in which we perhaps don't know the cues that tell us oh, how to gotcha. read things, so right? You, Our modern location so affects how we read. You're saying then you, you don't just read a, a, a literature, you have to know something about the people who heard that literature. I think it helps to try. Yeah. I don't know if we can. I don't but know what ancient of, Israelites thought. It's reconstruction as best you can. It, I do think we have something to gain from realizing our distance from the intended audience. Uh -huh. I do. Uh, even assuming there was just one audience. I mean, sure, audiences over time, absolutely. Uh, but clearly, whoever uh -huh. they were, we are a very different version of reader okay, or no. hearer because most of them probably didn't read originally. Well, yeah, yeah. Even if there, let's say there was a historical Jesus, and and most scholars I think yeah. would say yes. Mm -hmm. But the real question is, what was he like? And and the question is, could he read? Sure. He could certainly hear uh, material mm -hmm. read and right, he could right. memorize it. <laughs> Fortunately, I don't have to wade into those no, waters, you're in the, Joe. No, you're in the... <laughs> <laughs> I only it's, have it's, to do that occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> could David read? That's <laughs> yeah, could it? I mean... He could sing. <laughs> kings in the ancient world did create... They did um, commission inscriptions that were then mm. publicly displayed. But whether the king himself... Could read it. That's, that's an interesting... Yeah question. Uh, well, I've had relatives who could not. Sure, read. it's only, again, literacy yeah. is a modern, I mean, widespread yeah. literacy is a fairly yeah. modern phenomenon. Uh, I had an aunt who could not read, but she could run an entire business. Without needing with to. With very successful business. Sure. And she was also a counselor in the community. Right. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> like she couldn't read a word. <laughs> I so mean, we it, take for granted, especially now in an internet age, we take for granted that not only did this book exist in the form that we have it, but that everybody could just look at it and read it and understand it. Well, it took money uh -huh. to produce text. It took knowledge. It took free time to be able to learn uh -huh. to read, especially to learn to write. That's bef uh, before the printing press. Absolutely. That takes money. Absolutely. To copy them. Absolutely. And so then, we forget. Uh -huh. We forget because of perhaps maybe the internet above all things that texts were power in uh -huh. the ancient uh -huh. world. Uh -huh. And power, especially writing, that not everybody wielded. In fact, most people didn't. So not only the, the, the possession of a text, but the creation yeah, of a absolutely. text. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. That is an incredible amount of power. Words are power now. It will take Hammurabi's code, right? This is an obel. Uh, a yeah. stela that should have stood probably in a public space. We don't know exactly where. Mm -hmm. And on it is something like an idealized version of justice as the ancient Babylonians saw it. Mm -hmm. But the fact is the majority of people who might have walked by it certainly wouldn't have been able to read it. So in that case, why put it on a public monument? Well, part of the reason has to be the display of writing itself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is a symbol of power. So the person who could read had 
And he had also the power of interpretation. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, that's a lot of power. Yeah, so we just, I'm constantly reminding my students, you have to think differently in many regards than how you normally think if you, if you really want to engage this text. Uh -huh. That's an enormous gap. Between. It is. Uh -huh. It is. But, you know, of course, the oral tradition is strong, and that's very, very important. But yeah, talk about an oral tradition, and that, that exists before the written tradition. We assume. Um, Go. Explain that. So uh -huh. it's a hypothesis uh -huh. on our part as scholars that we can read parts of the Hebrew Bible and say, oh, this must have existed as a poem which was told, you know, in the temple or in the court or uh -huh. around campfires. And there's nothing in the biblical text that says, yes, this was uh -huh. an orally transmitted story. Uh -huh. uh, there are certain characteristics of writing which indicate that it more reasonably could have been something uh, like that uh, uh -huh. than something that was simply created to be written down. But um, the process during which things were transmitted orally is, you know, it's very fuzzy. Now what we know about it is incredibly complicated. Things so we used to be able to say, oh, this is old Hebrew poetry. It was, it was an oral communication. Now, yeah, pretty scholars disagree about that. And that's true of all history then. It is. I mean, we assume, I certainly assume that these stories were passed down in more than one story, a version and probably uh -huh. orally. Uh -huh. But beyond orally. that, it's hard for me to say which ones and in what way. I got you. It's, you know, it's impossible. You don't have a record of that's it. That's right. That's right. Well, how about a story like, uh, if I can remember, uh, one of the, was it the grandson or somebody of Aaron? And, married the wrong tribe. Uh, I can't remember the exact story now. Do you mean where um, you've got people forcibly circumcising? Oh, oh no. we got a call in. Let's see. What, uh, let's see. Let's hear from our caller. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, this is Chuck. Hey, Chuck. Uh, the comedian Louis Black, who is Jewish, says in one of his routines that when Christians adopted the Jewish Bible, they got it all wrong. Uh, did, did they get it wrong? And if so, what are some of the things that they, they messed up? <laughs> That's I'll a, hang up and let okay, listen to you. Okay, reply. thank you, thank you. That's a complicated question. Did they get it wrong? Uh, it sort of implies that there was a right, uh -huh, and that there was question. one right, and that you had to be measured against that particular right. And of course, as you know, if you know anything about Jewish tradition, there's lots of room for difference of opinion without ever necessarily needing to close off that dialogue, right? The rabbis are constantly commenting on parts of the text and disagreeing with each other, et cetera, and that seemed to be okay. So um, there are many streams flowing into just the river, and then the, there are many rivers in the... That's the case. And remember, Christians were Jews. Mm -hmm. They weren't called Christians. They were just Jews who followed Jesus. Uh -huh, uh -huh until that balance changes over some time where you've got more well what might be referred to as pagans roman religion you know oh, yeah, in the yeah. in the mediterranean um but so for the people at least who begin that movement of course the hebrew bible was their canon because it was scripture yeah i mean probably still open and fluid oh, what's what's the word canon mean we hear oh that that's a complicated question so let me finish this up Go ahead. Primarily where you get distinctions is eventually Christianity adopts the Greek translation uh -huh. of the Hebrew Bible, which was made many, many, many years earlier, yeah. hundreds of years earlier. Yeah. Whereas Judaism uses the Hebrew translation and then sometimes Aramaic versions as well. Yeah. So um, essentially some of the differences between Christianity and Judaism come down to, are you using the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible or are you using the Hebrew uh, version of the Hebrew Bible? The Septuagint, yeah. Right. right, right uh -huh. so, uh, so canon is a complicated so the, term. So the, 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 the Greek version, the Septuagint, LXX. Yes, LXX is the abbreviation. That, that itself is partly a translation, which tends to be sometimes an interpretation. Which oh, it's, any translation is an interpretation, interpretation, right? And honestly, what we know about the process through which Hebrew text became translated into Greek text is, we, we don't know that much. We have, uh -huh, uh -huh. We have um, sort of mythical stories about how it happened. But what we really do know is that we've got thousands of manuscripts of Greek translations of Hebrew that date through all sorts of different periods in time. And probably these began, you know, um, uh -huh. fifth century BCE or so, but where 
how how that process actually happened is not clear. And it's and it's not uh, so simple as a bunch of guys sat down and translated this into uh, Greek yeah. and there we're done. Right? We've got literally thousands of manuscripts of the Septuagint, of most so books the, so of the, the Bible. So it was not just some. Not even a committee sitting. Yeah, it's not a committee, right? The, the Jewish tradition has it that there was a committee of people who did this. But it's, it's scholars more, will tell you of the Septuagint will tell you that can't possibly be yeah, yeah, how it worked. Makes sense. Um, so. Okay. Okay. Now let's let's talk about Moses' yeah. figure. All right. Now I have a friend in, in Detroit who uh, works with archaeologists. Okay. And uh, she says that it's a possibility that. Much of the Moses story, if I'm mm -hmm. remembering what she says, is built around uh, the, the son of Ramses II, Chaim uh, Wasit, I think she calls him. And, uh -huh. and, and her view is that um, there were many stories already existing uh -huh. coming from Egypt and other places. Uh -huh. And much of the Hebrew Bible, or at least some of the Hebrew Bible, borrows some of these sure. stories mm -hmm. and re That's right. reworks them and gives them. A, 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 an ideological slant. You can yeah. see the ideological slant taking place in this country uh -huh. on trying to interpret the founding fathers. Oh, sure, right, right, absolutely. Uh, the example par excellence is the flood narrative, actually. The flood so narrative. Very clearly, Genesis is in communication, in my opinion, with the um, Epic of Gilgamesh, particularly the section of the epic from Babylon, uh -huh. well, in, for actually ancient Mesopotamia, it's got a very long history in different uh -huh. parts of Mesopotamia. But there's a section in there where there's in fact a flood. And there's a character who is warned about the flood, sort of. It's different than the Genesis account. Uh -huh. And the gods decide the humans are too noisy, so they got to get rid of them. They flood the earth. Utnapishtim mm -hmm. and his wife survive sort of by accident. The gods, of course, have forgotten that they need humans to sacrifice food so they can eat, uh -huh. so the gods uh -huh. then panic when they kill everybody. Uh -huh. And so Napishtim floats around in the water, sends off birds, birds bring back uh -huh. branches, the houseboat sort of lands, and he comes out and he makes a sacrifice. Sounds somewhat familiar. And much older than the Genesis account. Uh -huh. So for most scholars of the Hebrew Bible, I think they would say consensus opinion is that the narrative in Genesis knows the narratives from the ancient Near East, particularly okay, ancient Mesopotamia. Well, we see this a lot of times in literature. Absolutely. You can trace where, I mean, there, there's, I, I have a book at the house, for example, it can trace where they believe Dostoevsky borrowed from Charles Dickens. Ah, interesting. And we do know that he had a great respect for, Dickens. for, Char for Charles Dickens and really, but you can see a character lifted out uh -huh. and reworked. Right. And then sometimes Dostoevsky will just tell you what he's doing. But that doesn't make Dostoevsky a bad writer, no, right? I mean, that's the interesting writer. point is that then the assumption that if the, the, if the authors of Genesis somehow borrowed a text from Babylon or from uh -huh. ancient Mesopotamia in general, uh -huh. that that makes that text somehow bad. Oh, no, 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 no. You know, I mean, that, you it hear that make, a lot, in as, fact. As a story, make it, it may make it even better Well, as a and story. the differences are really significant. When you compare the two, you've got some standout moments, right? The uh -huh. god of Genesis uh -huh. is not capricious. Uh -huh. He doesn't kill off humanity because they're loud. Uh -huh. He very clearly makes an educated judgment based on the actions of the humans. So that's a little progress there. Yeah, it's a lot Moral of progress, progress, actually. I feel like not killing people because you're loud is probably good. <laughs> I feel like coming up with, if you're going to kill people, we can at least come up with a better reason to kill people. <laughs> Disturbed his sleep. <laughs> that's right. Okay. And he, you know, he's, he's got ethical <laughs> Yeah, I like that. Layers. Okay, we've got, got, we got a call, caller. Okay, let's hear from our caller, please. Go ahead. Hello, this is Faith with Forrest. I've been listening Go ahead. to the show and... Louder, louder. Heard the discussion about Gilgamesh uh -huh. and wanted to actually uh, dig into that a little bit more. Okay. I'm a real fan of the Gilgamesh tale. Isn't it great? Um, uh, yes, I, I especially like uh, the translation from, I think it's 2002 by uh -huh. Stephen Mitchell. That's right. Um, which has both the central Sumerian core of the story plus the Babylonian That's right. sort of lead in and, and closing piece. And I think there's something about the meal with the shepherd mm -hmm. uh, um, that is, I guess, uh, Babylonian. But um, in, in reading about um, uh, other uh, cuneiform script uh, translations, uh, I uh, recently learned that 
the Babylonian language is completely unrelated. They say as different as Chinese is to English from the Sumerian language. They're very different, that's right. And, and that made me think, oh, well, I think that explains another thing in the Bible, and that is that the Babylonians, having a Semitic language, when they apparently kind of conquered Sumer, but then assimilated their, their higher culture, uh -huh. they, they had to make up some sort of a tale for why their languages are different. And my guess is that that was probably currency, that that kind of a tale was going around, mm. and that we get an echo of that in the Old Testament with the Tower of Babel, which of course yeah. happens where there's, you know, tall towers like in Right, Schumer. right, right. Um, so, so I guess I was asking, are you, are you aware of any literature that, um, that lends credence to the fact that this is a popular story? I, okay. so remember, yeah. I'm not, I, I, I deal with the Near East, but I wouldn't present myself in a Assyri as an Assyriologist, right? There are people well, whose whole, whole lives yeah, are yeah. meant to be experts in ancient Mesopotamia and just, you know, in like a thousand years in one part of ancient Mesopotamia. Um, so, no, I don't necessarily off the top of my head know of many, many mythologies like the Tower of Babel mythology, but I don't think it's a bad guess that, in fact, there had to be stories that deal with the diversification of human language. The only thing I will say is um, the notion that Old Babylonian is very different from, say, Sumerian, that that is somehow tied to a military conquest. That was very common in scholarship a while ago, but um, essentially the only evidence for that would be the languages changing themselves. So it Language, might not have been a military conquest, right? It could have been that there was a gradual infiltration of various kinds of populations, yeah. and that's how a Semitic dialect enters into the region. Uh, but beyond that, I have no doubt that they had mythologies yeah. related to the diversification of languages. Sure. Well, thank you for the call. It's a great question. Well, th there's a kind of an interesting thing you just said, that you didn't think that there was, uh, that modern scholarship says that the evidence for a conquest is less strong. Yeah. Certainly, you know, um, when I first learned about this stuff, it would be in the late 1970s. Right, right. They talked about how clay tablets were often, um, you know, being made in, in scribal schools, right. which would be where the source for clay is, mud right. on the banks of the river, mm -hmm. and that when stored on wooden shelves uh -huh. during a military conquest, fire... That's right, occurs. burns them. That's right. And I guess I was under the impression that there was evidence of burn layers in the recovered tablets in some situations. I mean, there are destruction layers, and you're right, that's one of the reasons we have some of the tablets that we have. Uh, but. The reason that I'm being cautious is um, it was very common in the end of the 19th century and especially the beginning of the 20th century to assume that language changes somehow correlated with cultural changes and that those cultural changes by definition meant that a greater or stronger or higher power had somehow come in and conquered a lower or lesser power. Uh -huh. So uh, so I think you'll find that scholars are just very cautious about anything that sounds like that type of an argument because Yeah, you can make a, a good it case. It was a little problematic and it was used, that kind of argument was used in unfortunate ways by, for example, even the Nazi regime oh, yeah. to justify why Indo-Europeans were somehow, who they assumed were German, were mm -hmm. somehow um, better than other kinds of people because the language shifted, not because there was other evidence of a new huge cultural migration. So I'm not saying that there couldn't have been, I'm just, you're sensing in me a little bit of um, concern. Well, couldn't you make a case that uh, uh, it would be quite understandable at least that language changes partly because of trade. Sure, if right, there are lots of If you things, want to make a buck right. off of somebody or treat, treat before even bucks. Right, right, right. You, uh, you want the goods, you learn the language and how to mm -hmm. communicate so that you won't cheat each other. <laughs> and also get the goods you want. And no, that, there's that, lots of ways that language changes and modifies over time. So I don't, I'm not saying it's a horrible argument. I'm just a little bit worried skeptic, that we skeptic. don't really have yeah. the evidence to support a major population well, you have shift to just get the, that somehow eradicated one culture entirely and replaced it with a new one. Especially right, well, because... Let me ask one more question yeah. regarding sure. uh, yeah. my point of language and I'll free the line up sure. to more callers. So the example they were giving of language shift is uh -huh. that 
the principal goddess of Uruk was um, Inanna. That's right. I think in Sumerian scripts. That's and right. She becomes Ishtar That's in right. Babylonian. That's right. Now Babylonian, I'm told, being Semitic. Right. Uh, you know, to me they both sound like alien words. But right. is there something about Ishtar that then sounds more Hebrew-like as being, you know, a Semitic language that you could illustrate for those of us who know none of these things? Uh, well, of course, Ishtar is also Esther, right? So that's the same etymology ultimately. So Ishtar is not Hebrew, but Esther is. Um, and I mean, you are right. They are different language systems entirely. And like mm -hmm. many traditions, the Greeks included, when you have uh, population movement, which you assume must have been happening. You've got an, a, a desire to draw equivalencies between deities that were there and deities that have arisen or have been brought in. Uh -huh. So the Anana Ishtar equivalence is certainly on the table. Um, well, how, how many names would you say for a, a, a god? Oh, there could be hundreds. Yeah, that, You've got entire tablets that just do things like give uh -huh. you the names of deities and which ones are equivalent. Yeah. Even in the Hebrew Bible, how many would you? What, you well, depending on how you define a name, right? Uh, but I you've got, got you. the formal name of God. You've got Elohim. You've got uh -huh. El. You've got um, all sorts Adonai, of yeah, yeah. things which talk about attributes of the deity that uh -huh, could be uh -huh. considered names. Uh, El Shaddai is another one. Uh -huh. So. Oh, yeah. um, but sure. I wanted to come back to your earlier question just to point out that even though Akkadian is quite different from Sumerian, they do borrow Sumerian logograms. So Sumerian doesn't uh, go away when Akkadian begins to become more popular. They, so that's what makes write, reading cuneiform so hard, is because a particular sign could stand for an Akkadian syllable, uh -huh. but it could also be a Sumerian word. A whole word, all right. Yeah, and they, uh -huh. and they keep certain ones in particular because they in a certain way like us were antiquarians if they uh -huh. had a sense of drawing continuity over long periods sure, of time sure. so Samaria doesn't go away it actually gets repackaged in into Akkadian in ways that are incredibly frustrating if well, I guess you, I've heard that place names uh, get carried over sure absolutely get, right Tennessee itself may be something like a place name or you know a corruption right? of a place that's name. right and spell literature in ancient Mesopotamia also uses Sumerian phrases so it, it doesn't go away it, it's sure. well, let me clear the line and say thanks and you guys keep talking about this okay and well. hope get some more calls and on this interesting subject bye all bye oh, now thank you well, we're about ready for a mid-program break. All right. So, in case you're tuning in, this is the Free Thought Forum, and it's a program partly by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. The Free Thought Forum is funded jointly by these groups and by individual contributors. Uh, the shows are on each Tuesday, 5 to 6 Eastern uh, time here. Uh, so tell your friends and go streaming online to ctvnox.org. It's a call-in show, so we're glad to have you to call in. Now, let's go on with our uh, next part of the thing I wanted to ask you is, and if you look at the Oxford English Dictionary, you uh -huh. can see just the history of one word right. over centuries. Right, that's right. And I take therefore no thought for tomorrow is in the King James Version. Right, right. Well, the word thought, <laughs> I mean, my mother told me to think about tomorrow. Right, right, right. <laughs> so That's is this right. con is my mother being unbiblical? <laughs> well, maybe, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> but the word thought back in that day could mean worry. It's like care, yeah. Yeah, care, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. So, and then we still say take care. <laughs> Absolutely. And so words... And so it'd be understandable that in a tradition as ancient as the Hebrew tradition, yeah. uh, words themselves change meanings. The meanings, Absolutely. and then concepts mm -hmm. would modify. Absolutely. Um, I, I, sometimes I think sometimes people are against evolution because they don't want to even recognize evolution and development even in literature. Sure. But but it's it's so easy to see but once you. Uh, this, study the uh, biblical literature and then other, you can see, yeah, this is a development. Uh, no, I think you're right. Here's, here's another, another caller. Go ahead. Um, hi, this is Jeremy Bryant. 
I have a question. Go. Uh, basically, I'm a Christian who's listening to this program, uh -huh. and I, I like to hear other people's opinions looking at the Bible from an outsider's perspective, seeing in. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. See, I'm very pragmatic with what I believe. I don't take everything literal, uh -huh. but what I've wondered is some of the stories, like the uh, Noah's Ark, mm -hmm. have so many parallels in so many different cultures around the world. Uh -huh. Don't you think there's a possibility there's something behind it that's true? Because there's so many different ones across so many different uh, languages. I mean, I can't think of a single culture on Earth that doesn't have a flood story. Well, Jeremy, let me ask you a question. If you say something behind it that's true, do you mean true as in meaningful, or do you mean true as historically accurate? As in historical. So my, my, this is a good question. It's a question I get uh, in my classroom a lot. Um, so the uh -huh. first answer is, it depends on your starting point. If you believe that a deity is capable of doing anything and that that deity does it supernaturally, then there's no reason to look for scientific evidence to support it. A deity could, if a deity is all powerful, theoretically flood an entire earth if this happened, and then not have any evidence scientifically. So if you put on a theological hat, that's a different set of questions. If you ask me as a historian and as an archaeologist, can I find evidence or proof if we're going to use that kind of language, then I have to tell you that everything that I have studied, fossil records, geological movements, you name it, tell us that um, it's not supported that a worldwide, if you mean global, flood in one circumstance happened all at one time. So well, I have to, we have that. to own, oh, no, but I'm just, so that's sort of the starting point. But then let me, um, let me ask you a question in return. In the Joseph narrative, it says that the entire world came down to Pharaoh because there was a famine in the land. And it says very literally the entire world. And I know this isn't your position. Um, but for people who take the biblical text very literally, mm -hmm. does that mean that Eskimos, came to Pharaoh to get bread because there was a famine in the land. No, of course it doesn't mean that, right? But it does say all the world. Uh -huh. So if we're going to say in the Joseph narrative that no the phrase, world. right, exactly. So if we're going to say in the Joseph narrative that all the world means the known world, even then, okay, then we can't just go to the, the flood account and say, well, all the world here means all the world bottom line. All the known world at the time. Right, no, so no. then if we're dealing rather than a universal flood, if we're dealing with a Mediterranean flood, say. There have been people who have claimed to identify evidence in the Black Sea that prove that some sort of massive cataclysmic flood event happened. Mm -hmm. Okay, I figured that there was something. But that is still very, very preliminary and very speculative. And you have to be worried about people who make grand claims based on science. Science does best when it picks away at probabilities and every once in a while there's a major paradigm shift but most of us are happy just figuring out was there you know a flood in the village where I'm excavating anytime people start to talk about Noah David Solomon then you have to be a little skeptical that the science can't quite support the claims being made based on the science um, what you could claim is that uh, see what the uh, reviewer agree you you think you, and I would think you got evidence or and, you know, around different parts of the world that there were floods. Because people lived by water. And then, therefore, there are going to be flood stories. Sure. And if you say their world, and we got to say, well, who in particular? Their world might have been very small compared to what you think a world Absolutely. is today. So it, their world could have been flooded, and that would have been a, a true story given the historical context. Yeah, and there, exactly. I have no doubt that Israelites, like Mesopotamians, experienced flooding. They do today. Mm -hmm. For example, in Mesopotamia, uh, that might be the Tigris and the Euphrates. In Israel, it's flash flooding. Right? The Jordan River is not going to flood. There's no geological evidence that we've got a massive flood in Israel. But Yeah, that's where I'm coming from. It's right. But there is... For example, a friend of mine sent me video footage of the southern Israeli desert, I don't know, three years ago after there had been one day of pouring rain, and it destroyed bridges. The Israeli army had to come out and lift people with helicopters. So I think what you sense when you sense flood stories in different places is the common human experience of flooding 
my, uh, my husband's family is from Minnesota. And they can tell you an awful lot about oh, living yeah, yeah. in an yeah, area sure that can. floods and having to deal with the total devastation for years <coughs> after the fact. And if you took the view that any disaster like that could be a punishment from a sure. deity or you have by, to come up with why something like that yeah. happens. And if you didn't have a scientific explanation, you've got an anthropomorphic right. world and you've got to say, well, some person, cosmic person, right brought it about. So. Ultimately what I find really compelling about the Genesis narrative is when you line it up with other flood narratives, especially from the same region in the roughly the same time period, you get a very specific argument for why mm. Israel's God is superior to the gods oh, of other yeah, places. Yeah. And I the, think that's an important part of the narrative, regardless of whether or not it happened. Oh, you notice the Noah flood account doesn't actually tell you when it happened. It gives you no historical detail whatsoever. Yeah. That's not what he's uh, interested in. Gonna, right. Go ahead. I was just going to ask about this uh, idea of a global a flood. Um, yeah. That there was a huge flood in that area that might have been a lot bigger than the ones previous or after that might have created this. I mean, that's the theory of some of these folks working in the Black Sea, that the Mediterranean would have flooded at some point. <laughs> Ultimately, from my perspective, whether or not mm -hmm. the story in Genesis is talking about a flash flood that destroyed a territory or or something larger it doesn't change the importance of the story. The story doesn't rise and fall on how big the flood was. It rises and falls on the character attributed to God, on the character attributed to the human agents, on the promises made after the flood ceases. Yeah. Right? For well, let, me, let, that is the most meaningful part of the story. Yeah. Let me ask, my thing with faith, let, um, let me ask you. faith is that I look for scientific evidence to back up what I believe. Like, that's why I don't don't agree with my Mormon friends because they don't have anything to back up their Sure. Let me let me give you the warning I give friends of mine. So uh, as an archaeologist, I frequently have people ask me, are you digging things that prove the Bible? As an archaeologist, uh -huh. my job is to go into an area with better technology than uh -huh. the people who excavated it previously and show why their conclusions were correct or incorrect uh -huh. and then create better conclusions. Uh -huh. That's not the greatest mixture with faith, right? My whole job is to unseat previous misconceptions and create new and better knowledge. And then I uh, assume that 20 or 30 years from now, the next generation of archaeologists will do exactly the same thing. That's what any good electrician does. So He says, how, how did I make a mistake on this last week? How did I improve it? <laughs> right. I know a lot of people function this way. For me, it's always been um, a little bit of a marriage between, you know, a bird and a fish. Uh -huh, the uh -huh. faith and the archaeological scientific backing for it. Yeah, I, I got you. Let me, let's, uh, is our caller, are you still there? Yeah. Let me ask you this. Um, do you have any problem with uh, the, the moral part of that story in which on this story, uh, God drowns all those <laughs> little in innocent little right. children. Yeah. Does that, does, do you have any moral problem with that? Well, they've been raised in a society that they, they're going to turn out corrupt. So he sees the future and the past. He doesn't sit in our present like we do. He doesn't exist in time like you and I do. He sees past and future as if it's one time. So he, he sees it from a different perspective than you. So obviously, he would see it from a perspective that wouldn't be able for us to understand. Well, I can see that helps you live with it morally, doesn't it? Yeah, it makes it makes more sense that way. Because, I mean, literally, the Hebrew thing, yeah. it seems to translate to he lives in the eternal present, where our past, present, future, that's just present Okay, to him. okay let me ask you this. On your view, did the Lord God of the universe foresee all of this drowning of little children before he created the world? Ah, that's a problem. Possibly, but... What, what do you mean, possibly? <laughs> you're you're a oh. theist, right? No, yeah. let, uh, let's not... I really don't know. Well, your theory, your theology says the Lord God of the universe is omniscient. Now, maybe you've got another theology that I don't know of. Yeah, I, I would say well, so, he would. Okay, let's be <laughs> consistent. Then if he's omniscient and knows all, he knew he was before he created the world, he was going to drown all of these innocent children, right? Well... That's called intelligent design, right? Well, they might not... He, he knew beforehand what was going to happen, yes. Did he do it or not? Did he yeah. know about it? 
Yeah. And he created the world so he knew what was going to happen in infinite detail, did he or didn't he? Yeah. Okay. He knew he was going to murder all of these kids, right? Well, he knew he was, that was going to end that's, up happening, that's but he, he left humans free will to choose. The way I look at it is like... All right, guys, wait, we're wait. pretty far from the Hebrew Bible at this point. <laughs> Let me just weigh in. We're, we're definitely in Christian theology. So uh, is that, let's get back uh, to the text a little bit Well, there bit is here. a passage in the Hebrew Bible that says, love your neighbor. Now, that's a strange use of the word love of your neighbor as you drown most of their children. Well, and deities you know, in the, the ancient the world weren't meant to be understood. Though. No, no, no I don't. I don't think. I don't think they foresaw all of this. What I'm saying is, often the stories are told, and then the implications are not seen at the time. That's true of all of sure, us. Sure, right, right. And then it takes our friends and our. I've had friends who have done this. Joe, you said this. Did you really mean this? Uh -huh, sure, and then right. I follow through with it, and I say, Thank well, no, I guess I I'm going to have to back up because yeah. it doesn't make right, sense. Right, right. And I'm thinking, well, I. I'm sorry we're going to have to go on to something else, but you gave us something to think about, Absolutely. and I hope we've given you something to think about, too, and that's, that's useful. One more point. Go. One last point. Mm -hmm. My last point is that I'm a scientist who studies physics when it comes to, like, theoretical stuff, and the, world, I, the way I look at the world is quantum theory, that everything that can't happen does happen, just a different parallel universe, different extent of things. So I believe God sees all the possible decisions humans make, but we have free will to choose which path of those infinite possibilities we take. Okay. Which is hard to grasp. That's how I see the world. I know. That's the thing I know. I know. That, theory doesn't make sense to anyone, but... Yeah, that, that's, not, that's not that complicated. In fact, that's called Arminianism. Okay. Oh, there's a name for it. Yeah. Uh -huh. In fact, uh, 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 E.S. Brightman, you might want to look this up, in his book, A Philosophy of Religion, yeah. He, he has a God who doesn't have all knowledge of all things because he has a notion of novelty, and that comes from Heisenberg's physics. So God could not possibly know all because the universe has some, some chance and novel el elements in it. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying he well, okay. every possible path. Well, uh, All right, guys, are we going to talk about the uh, ancient program. Hebrew Bible or are we, <laughs> we'll we going to talk about modern Bible. theology? Thank you. Appreciate it very much. <laughs> back to the Hebrew. I don't think the Hebrew Bible had Heisenberg's physics yet. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that might be a little bit later than the construction of the text. Okay, okay let's go. Uh, uh, let's, oh, turn it. Yeah. There we go. But what strikes me, and see what you think, you have incredible kindness and goodness in the Hebrew Bible, and uh -huh. you have incredible viciousness in the You world. do. That's correct. That's why I say it's a, it's, it is a truly... It's a hard book. Yeah. It is a hard book. You've got to be okay with killing lots of people. Uh, oh That's God. right. Yeah. In fact, I've got a book written in... Well, I thought I brought it with me. Yeah. This yeah. is written in Israel. Uh-huh. But... It, yeah. To kill and take possession. Yeah, actually, there's even in the last 20 years, there's been a lot of work on Israelite warfare and implications for warfare. Yeah. Uh, it's hard. I mean, the fact is, if you want to read this book, you're going to have to read all of it. It's, it's, it's pretty bloody. And there are things which are softer for us to read, and there are things which are hard for us to read. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, well, accepting it means dealing with all of it, not choosing what parts you're going to pay attention to. Would you agree that the Hebrew Bible is revelation of you and me? about human beings. I find it incredibly insightful yeah. about the human condition. It is. That's as it? much as I'll say. I won't use the R word, <laughs> only because <laughs> revelation means very different things to different I, I, people. I, I, so no, it's not I, got, to, I uh, got you. confuse anybody. Well, we've got another caller. Let's go ahead, please. We had another previous caller that was good. Go ahead. Hi, I was wondering ask Good and loud, please. Pardon? Hello? Oh, uh, we can't hear you. Speak up, please. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Okay. I was I had a quick question, I hope a quick question, about Moses. I'm assuming that uh, the Pharaoh in Moses was Ramses II, and this would have been about 100 years after Amenhotep. And so I'm asking, what are the chances, your opinion, mm -hmm. that Moses ripped off his one god from the one god of Amenhotep? who was... Uh, you mean Akhenaten? Well, yeah. I believe he had two names. Yeah, right, he changed his name to Akhenaten. Okay, so here's the really hard answer. There's absolutely no evidence that the pharaoh of Exodus actually corresponds with any historical figure in Egypt. 
Okay. Um, right. There are large, very, very spirited debates about whether if the Exodus event happened, it happened in the 15th century or if it happened in the 13th century. And there are cases to be made on either side, but neither is especially convincing. Okay. Well, accepting that, right. that there's no good evidence. Right. I mean, not at this time, right? Archaeology yeah, yeah, is yeah, exciting. Yeah, yeah, it can yeah. always change. But right now, I have to say, as an archaeologist, uh, it's not implausible well, that a section of people who were in Egypt then came into the land of Canaan. Uh -huh. But whether or not the events happened as they're described historically in Exodus. That's another matter. Yeah, well, that's I'm not a hard talk one. I'm not talking about historically. I'm just talking about the order of the births of the, uh -huh. uh, of the uh, central characters. Yeah, but, we don't know. But uh, it just seems so coincidental. Right, that's right. That, uh, that's a good point. That uh, Moses' God was absolutely patterned on the Egyptian gods. So... This is a very good question and one that scholars have debated for quite some time. To what extent did the religious reforms in Egypt under Ankhenaten somehow it, um, influence Israelite religion? Mm -hmm. So the first thing I'll say mm -hmm. about that is that ancient Israel was not monotheistic. Bottom line. We know that because the prophets are continuously telling people to stop worshiping other gods. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, I see. I believe uh, right, Ben would disagree with you on that. I, I believe a would... lot of people would disagree with me on that. But uh, I also believe that a lot of people would agree with me. So I'm all right. I'm in good company. Well, um, here's, here's the similarities that I've noticed. Now, if one is exactly like or exactly opposite, it means that they're patterning. It appears as though they're patterning, whereas Egyptians had art. Moses forbid it. Egyptian, Egyptian had fashion. Moses forbid it. Egyptians had uh, judicious judicious death penalty Moses prescribed the death penalty for just about you know spitting on the sidewalk well and everything let's give Moses a little bit of credit yeah, here, yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. well there was very in little. the ancient world it was more common to have death in general in any so, form so you're not seeing a whole lot of correlation so I'm, I'm not suggesting that there I mean I can't tell you there was no cross pollinization cross-pollination there. What I can tell you is this. The first question you have to ask yourself is the texts from Ankhenaten are New Kingdom Egypt. The texts about Moses, though they claim to be about the time period that would have been late bronze to, you know, towards the Iron One transition, mm -hmm. in fact, are much later. The texts themselves yes. may represent early oral, oral tradition, but many of them were edited multiple times. We know mm. that the Moses narratives represent multiple strands of stories mm. that were seamed together. Oftentimes, you can even see the seams, and that the date of those stories is quite far removed from late Bronze Egypt. So that's okay. the first complication. That doesn't so, mean there wasn't an influence. It just means it's more complicated than we think. So. So, for example, the prohibition against images, right? First of all, there's a debate about whether or not and to what extent that actually prohibited images. Oh, yeah. Second of all, there's a debate about whether or not ancient Israel might have been sort of an iconic culturally and that all people were talking about was simply a de facto state of affairs rather than a requirement. Third, there's the date of the prohibitions, both in the Decalogue, so that's Exodus and Deuteronomy, the Ten Commandments, and the longer version of the image prohibition. And those tend to be quite late, yes, actually. Yeah. So the extent to which images were actually prohibited, that's hard to say. Okay. Um, well, are, let me, let me ask you, maybe you can nail this down for me. Who do I have to blame for circumcision, the Egyptians <laughs> or Moses? Oh, that's ancient. That's I'm not going to blame Moses only because... Um, Moses, like David, like Solomon, is, is awfully hard to find in the historical record, right? We have a very complicated series of well, mythologies about Moses. So most scholars will tell you that circumcision in Judaism is primarily after the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and exile a good portion of the population. Yeah, try to, try to, try to boil it down to the Egyptians' fault. Yeah. The Egyptians circumcised. Yes, okay. So so, do the, so we assume did the Israelites, though I haven't found a circumcised penis in an excavation, so I can't tell no, you for no, sure. So. Um, I can tell you that the, the date of the stories is, implies that it was later. So when Israelites start circumcising, you know, I, I don't actually have any evidence. No. It could have been an influence from Egypt, or it could have been a much bigger thing much later in the history of the culture. Well, one thing that Joe said once before, and I was wanting to ask this question too, is that Joe said that the uh, the uh, hell of the Bible actually appears in the Old Testament, and I was 
wanting to tell me what the what that uh, I, Did I didn't you say see that. that. Uh, if I said that, I'll have to say I was wrong. <laughs> Did you say that, too? Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, no, I don't think I... Well, sort of it does, right? Gehenna comes from Gehenom, the Valley of Hinnom, which was Valley one of the Hinnom. valleys That's... that surrounds Jerusalem, known mm. for um, burning and, and tombs and stuff and, and trash and all sorts of bad, yucky things. So, But suffering for, for eternity was not part of no, that. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. The closest thing you get in the Hebrew Bible is the book of Daniel. So we're looking there at about a finishing date of 165 or so. Yeah. And even in that case, you don't have any mention of life after death. What you have is a very cryptic verse in, in chapter 12 that says that the righteous at the end of days will be raised up to the stars. But it doesn't tell us anything about what happens to Afterwards. wicked people. Yeah, yeah. Or, or anything else about the righteous. Yeah. So, no. In, in the Hebrew Bible, I can say, I think pretty firmly, most people die. They all go to some shady place called Sheol that's kind of like Hades. And the expectation was, if you are living a good life, you will live a long life, you'll have lots of kids, you will die a peaceful uh -huh. death. If you're bad, you will die violently without children. You know, Jezebel's eaten yeah, by your, dogs. Your immortality sort of was in your kids. So, when you're, yeah. so, with the Old Testament God, when God killed you, he was done with you. But in this vicious, vicious Jesus Christ New Testament, God's not through with torturing you while you're alive, but long after you're Well, dead. it's interesting you bring this up because I was teaching this actually today. Um, so when you read the Bible, if you read the Christian Bible in the order you receive it, all of a sudden you get to the New Testament. And there's demons everywhere where there uh -huh. were hardly any yeah. in the Hebrew yeah. Bible. And you've got Satan this and Satan that and hell this and eternity that. And it feels very jarring as if Christians somehow it's came an, up with this. Uh, even, but they didn't. Even the so-called Satan in Job is, is a member of the heavenly right, court. Right, right. He's, he's the adversary. Satan just yeah. means adversary. Plus, However, there are a series of books that people don't read because they're not in the canon that primarily reflect what we call apocalyptic tendencies, like end times stuff. And already in these books, like the Book of Enoch, for example, you uh, begin to see Jewish tradition making a differentiation. So that's after Daniel. Well, actually, Enoch is before Daniel, is, oh, this even is though it's not in, uh, I mean, I like, you, yeah. slightly before Daniel, even though it's not in the canon. Um, so the, what you notice is that Jewish tradition is struggling amongst themselves. There's multiple opinions, as there always are, about what happens after death, what happens to the person, uh, 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 uh. is the soul immortal, is there retribution now, is it in the afterlife? They are struggling in different versions of Judaism in the second century BCE to the second century CE are in working through this issue, and Christianity is well, another version of that. Well, we're not in eternity, although no. I, I, I once heard a preacher's wife say, say to him, Dear, don't forget, we are not in eternity when you speak again. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for the answers, y'all. I do appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for your yeah, call. We'll have to have her back, right? Bye-bye. Uh, okay. Bye now. Okay, the, this uh, group of the... the uh, Atheist of Knoxville and the Rationalist of East Tennessee meet uh, the ASK twice a week, and we have meetings with the, the Rationalist of East Tennessee, and uh, uh, we ought to have some material on the on the screens if we have time. But anyhow, look look up rationalist.org, uh, and then uh, ask information, uh, and, and uh, you can communicate with us. But look us up on uh, the internet, and uh, I want to thank you for oh, being thanks. here with us, opening well, Joe, up a can whole. Can I take a chance to plug the next um, AIA yeah, lecture? Yeah, would you? Next week, 7:30 p.m. Tuesday. It's a historical background of Homer's Iliad. Please, 7:30 UT. McClung Museum, come on out, support this national lecture. 7:30 p.m. 7:30 p.m. Oh, and the date. Uh, is it Tuesday the 9th? Is that what I've got? Yeah, April, Tuesday, April 9th. Tuesday. Okay, uh, at UT. Yeah, yeah that, the Fung Museum Auditorium. It'll be a fantastic lecture. Uh, well, I want to thank you for this. And we'll, Thanks, Joe. We'll Thanks this for again having me. Open up a new gate. <laughs> 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 thank you out there for being with us. Be with us next week, 5 o'clock. Goodbye.